Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Mary Helen Hensley, and uh, greetings from Ireland. Um, as you can see, I'm in my office. I've just finished work. I am a chiropractor and a metaphysician, author of 10 books, um, and I'm really excited to be here with you to tell a story that, in my case, is just never gets old. Um, so I'd like to share with you something that happened to me many, many moons ago and the impact that it's had on my life. Um, in December of 1991, 91 it was, um, it was December 14th. I was on my way to a Christmas party and little did I know, you know, I was just a new college graduate. I was living in my boyfriend's hometown. I was starting my new life after four years in college, and I was coming up to a traffic intersection um, about a mile from my apartment, and what I didn't realize was that I was approaching the metaphysical and metaphorical crossroads of my life. So um, I sat at this light, and I waited um, for my light to turn green, and this was quite a large highway. It was Highway 17 in Charleston, South Carolina. So there's lots of lanes coming this way, lots of lanes going this way into town. And so I was sitting here and I was going to be going across the traffic and hanging a left um, on my way to this Christmas party. So, you know, I was decked out. I was wearing bright red Bermuda shorts and a Santa Claus t-shirt, a lovely Swarovski jingle bell around my neck that my mother had given me. So I was just like feeling good. You know, it's hot in South Carolina, even in December. So um there I was, I sat and sat and sat, and then all of a sudden my light turned. And so I began to make my way across traffic and I made it across that first lane, that second lane, and then into that third lane. And then all of a sudden I looked and the car that was coming towards the light had absolutely no intention of stopping. The police estimated um, after the accident based on the uh, damage to the car that this man had been going 75 miles an hour. So I had what they call a T-bone um, impact, which is the car hits directly into the driver's side and T-bones the car around the car that makes the impact. Um, so it was just myself sitting in a little Toyota Corolla. And um, this is when everything changed in my life. I grew up in the Bible Belt in Virginia and I was a preacher's daughter and absolutely everything that I had been taught to believe that would happen upon my death. Remember, I'm only 21 years old, so it's not really something you sit around thinking about a lot. Um, <clears throat> but everything I'd been taught to believe did not happen. It happened in a completely different way, which is what makes it so special and unique to me, really authentic, um, because it was something that unfolded organically and naturally, as opposed to it being some kind of projection of, of something I had been told or taught to believe. So um, what was really fascinating was in this moment when I looked and I realized that I was getting ready to get um, hit by this car, I just had this overwhelming knowing that I was getting ready to die. And there was absolutely no panic. There was no fear. It was just like, oh, okay, here we go. It's time to go. Um, and what was fascinating at this point was that there was a sound. I live in Ireland, like I said, and I play Irish, uh, traditional Irish music. I'm a Bowron player, which is the round drum, you know, you hit with a little tipper. And um, so my favorite instrument is to play with uh, the Ilian pipes. Ilian means elbow in Irish. And so when they fill up the pipes, it makes this amazing drone that I find just so beautiful. And that's the only thing I can liken this sound too at that stage there was this drone it was beautiful i have since come to realize many years later um that that vibration was the frequency that was keeping me tethered to the earth plane keeping me tethered to the physical experience the corporal experience um in this body is mary helen and so um as this sound was playing everything ground to a halt and so the cars were coming at a snail's pace, like you could barely even tell they were moving. And I had all the time in the world to decide, okay, how are you going to play this kid? Which was, I thought was really, really interesting because all of a sudden it was like, I was in control. It's like, I was directing the scene of how my death as Mary Helen was going to play out, which is kind of cool when you think about it. So 
I, I, I kind of weighed my options and I was like, well, you know, I could stay inside the body, experience that impact and then go, or I could leave the body and then the impact takes place and I don't have to feel anything. Well, obviously, you know, option B sounds much more exciting. Um, so that's exactly what I did. I, me, the real I am made a choice. And it was in that moment that I totally realized, oh, I'm not this body. Hear me again when I say that. You're not that body, that meat suit, that, that fabulous vehicle that you're traveling around with. That's not who you really are. And a lot of people are like, ah, I know this. But when you approach a moment like this and you separate from the suit and you're watching your death unfold, it brings it to a whole new light. Let me tell you, um, I'll, I'll never be the same for having seen it. But um, I made a decision in that moment that I was going to exit. And so once the decision was made, it was like, whoop, everything sped up. And that car came barreling towards. And now I'm up and out of the body and I'm looking down and I get to witness my own death. I see this car smash into the side of my car. It T-bones. And, um, you know, I see my body, I'm buckled in and I see my head go through the driver's side window, which is at the point where my neck broke and the seat folding up underneath me. And, you know, I had my little tan legs and my Bermuda shorts and there was glass everywhere. And I could just watch, I could see the shattered glass sticking into my legs and I could see that seat folding underneath me. And to me, from that bird's eye view, I look like a little puppet. I was just kind of hanging there caught by the seat belt. The neck was laying completely over. It just looks so odd because I didn't realize it was broken. Um, nor did I care. This is where it gets really fun. So I'm kind of watching this with this detached interest. And I like to add in at this stage of the explanation because it helps people really sink their teeth into what it's like. Imagine if you were outside and you were working in the lawn, you were mowing the grass or um, you'd been playing sports or doing whatever. You were really hot and sweaty and sticky and nasty and gross. And you come in the back door of your house and you peel off those dirty clothes and you throw them down by the washing machine. And then you go have the best shower ever. While you're in that shower, the very last thing that you're thinking about is those clothes down by the washing machine. And that's what it's like leaving the body. At least it was in my experience. I wasn't pining away. I wasn't going, oh my God, I'm only 21. Um, it just wasn't like that. I just was like, oh, okay, well, this round is done. And here I am and I'm in this space and I'm going, oh, okay, I recognize this. This feels familiar. What was really interesting in that moment was I looked from where I had been uh, coming across the traffic and I realized once all the cars had stopped, a girl that I went to college with, um, she was actually my sweet mate in college, had been a couple of cars behind me. Now, Charleston's a big city. And so the coinkydink that she would have been in the car, a, a couple of cars behind me was really fascinating because outside and detached from the physical, I got to watch her recognize me, recognize my car, realize that I'm dead, watch her reacting to this. It was wild, guys. I got to actually feel, I could just feel all of the emotions. And, you know, there's this part of you that's just, you're just soaking it in and experiencing. You're like, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. Relax. Everything's okay. And, um, you know, so I had that crazy experience. And then I got to watch um, a man in uniform come over to the passenger side of the car and the windows had all blown out. And so he reached across and he turned the ignition off so the engine wouldn't blow. And so it was at that stage that that sound changed and all of a sudden it began to speed up. And this is, I can only call it the music of the spheres, the, you know, the symphony of the stars. It was just, I've never heard anything like it. And uh, trust me, I've been looking, I've never heard anything like it ever since. Um, it was the most beautiful symphony. Have you ever had a piece of music that you absolutely love and it just sends you to another place? Okay. Well, picture that on steroids times a billion. Um, it's kind of like that. And it's just this amazing energy and frequency that's coursing through everything that you are. And so at this stage, I realize that this is where a lot of people who have an NDE talk about going through the tunnel of light. No, I didn't have that experience at all. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I did because I didn't. It was like I was here one second and then I was here. 
So if this tunnel happened, I missed it. It was so fast or it was so not necessary for my experience or whatever. It just didn't happen there. I was here one second and then I was here in the next. And in this space, what was so incredibly cool is I was now resonating at a different frequency. That music had lifted me up into a totally different vibe. And all of a sudden I realized, oh gosh, I have form. I know who I am, but I didn't have a body. How do you describe that? I guess it's like a, you know, somebody loses an arm and they've got the phantom arm. It's like, oh, Mary Helen just lost the body. There she was, freshly dead. And uh, I could still feel myself, my presence, my outline, my form. And I could certainly remember who I'd just been. But here's the kicker. All of a sudden at lightning speed, I could remember everybody else I'd been. Now, from a, pre for, you know, a preacher's daughter from the South, this was not something they ever taught in Sunday school, I can guarantee. And this was certainly never anything I heard from the pulpit. This was brand new for me. This was what was so exciting to me. This is what really, um, I lay awake at night still at the age of 54 thinking about this. It was incredible. I'm so incredibly grateful for that moment, that experience um, of, of recognition of, oh yeah, oh, this is who I really am. And there was a lot of that, a lot of ahas and a lot of, oh, yes, there was no pining. There was no, you know, oh my gosh, I didn't get to do this or I didn't, it just wasn't like that. It was like in that moment, I remembered I can do any of that one anytime I want to in any form. And um, I just sat in that space and I basked until such time that the atmosphere, which was palpable, by the way, guys, I could like touch it, mold it, shape it. Um, these two beings stepped out of the atmosphere. They took shape and form. As a kid, I had always loved old people. And I loved, I loved the old men at the nursing home. I used to go sit with them and sing with them. And I, I actually look back and I think I really liked watching the death process. It's, I've never been afraid of death. Um, and as a little kid, I used to love watching the fireworks because when somebody is amping up to leave the, the earthly experience, it's not like a dimmer switch goes on and everything gets dull and lifeless. It's quite the opposite. It's like this magnificent, colorful fireworks display. And as long, you know, I think between six and 12 months, I have seen it out. Um, I've never really seen it longer than that. Um, so that fireworks display for me, and I've seen a lot of, of, of people who were going through the death process, guys. Um, so the longest I've ever seen out before the death takes place is about 12 months, typically more like three to six. Um, so we used to like hanging out in those spaces. So when I get into this glorious space of recognition where I'm kind of coming home and returning to my, my true me, the great I am that I really am, of course, I'm going to conjure old men because I love them. And that was security for me. That was wisdom. Um, that just, I always respected them. I loved their life experiences. I loved to be told their stories. So that's how they appeared. Did they have to appear like that? No. And who are they? Well, it took me a little while to remember because, um, you know, you're sitting in that space and it's like, I know who you are. You ever had somebody's name on the tip of your tongue and you know, you know, you know them. It happens to me in this office all the time. I can see somebody for 20 years in here and I've always seen them in this room, um, in this setting. But then if I run into them in, at aisle nine in the grocery store, what was your name again? It was that sensation. So I'm like looking at these guys going, I know who you are. And they just waited. And I was like, oh my gosh, who are they? Well, finally the light bulb goes on and I realized that these are my guides, my guardians. Yes, we have them guys. And again, not something we learned in Sunday school, this concept of these beings. And let me tell you, they weren't angels. There were no wings. Um, I'm sure they manifest for different people in different ways. Energetically, these guys looked solid. They looked physical. They were, they were these men and I felt safe in this space. Um, you know, you've just been dead for God's sake and you're coming through this. And so, you know, to be greeted there, what I thought was very interesting was that I wasn't greeted by my family members and, you know, being raised in a Christian household, I wasn't greeted by Jesus. There wasn't this, it, it just wasn't like that. Um, so 
what actually did happen was they sat and waited for me to recognize them. And when I did, and after we celebrated this glorious homecoming, and I realized that these guys in whatever form they'd been in had been with me since day dot. You're never, ever, ever, even at your very lowest moment, ever alone. And so when I got to see these guys and, and, and recognize that, the next thing that was to happen in this near-death experience was the life review. Talk about a game changer, y'all. Um, again, this is so complete opposite of anything I'd been, ever been taught to believe or I'd learned growing up. Um, and that's just, I talk to you about it now and I've literally got chills. You know, I was 21 when this happened. I am 54 years old and I can, I can woo myself when I tell the story. It was just so incredible. Um, it was so incredible. You've got absolutely nothing to fear, guys. Oh, you just don't. So I'm in this space and it's time for the life review. And all of a sudden with these two beings that are just like the most loving, non-judgmental, amazing, just natural forms for me to be with, they're there. And all of a sudden it was like my entire world turned 360. This was incredible because it was at this point that my concept of the space-time continuum just imploded. Because what was happening was, first of all, I'm looking around going, where's, where's the judge? Do you know? Where's God? Because I really had been um, taught to believe gr growing up. You know, we didn't focus on it. My dad wasn't like a holy roller or anything. He was more a sports-oriented um, pulpit master he loved he, he was a football coach and so everybody loved his sermons because they were always sports related um that kind of of dynamic speaker that he was so um but there was always a reverence for you know you need to do this and this and this in order to get here um and so we never really talked about hell or anything like that um so it was really funny in this moment i'm like looking around and all of a sudden it's like there's all this activity happening around me in 360 and I'm looking and I'm realizing again there's no one judging it's just me and the and the two beings they're not judging and so I grab out a, a thought I grab out an image and you know this is Mary Helen falling off her bicycle at eight years old and um I was coming down the hill and I just got a new um, BMX with the banana seat, gold and green. It was fabulous. And I had a kid on the back of the bike that shouldn't have been on there with me. And we were going and out came this dog from nowhere and right into the bike. And we flipped. Now, it just so happened that she and her parents were visiting from Florida to my parents' house. And my parents and her parents had gone out to dinner. So we had to rock up. She'd broken her arm. I was like road burned from head to toe. It was not a pretty sight, but it was in this moment. I could remember and I could feel and I could see there was my father who was always my big fan and cheerleader, but he was also very stern. And, you know, the state of the two of us, they have to take the girl off to the hospital. And in this moment, I could feel this first ping. And my dad kind of sold me out in that moment because he was so embarrassed that these people's child had been injured at my hand. And it wasn't kind of like, hey, are you okay? It was like, oh my gosh, we are so sorry that she's done this. She shouldn't have been out. She and there was that first ping and this feeling. And in that moment, in that review, I could feel the feeling. And I was like, oh, but then I could feel his feeling behind it. And I could see why he had done that. It was instantaneous. So, you know, then you, you move forward. I'm getting my first bulldog, Otto von Bismarck. And I had three, one, two, and three. Um, at the age of 11 and I was very excited. It was a huge moment in my life because my dad was our football coach. We were the Martinsville Bulldogs and I now had a real live authentic bulldog called Otto von Bismarck. And I was a proud mother. And so I could feel that moment. I could feel that pride, how much that meant to me to have that dog. I go back to when I'm four years old and my parents sit me down at the kitchen table for the kitchen table talk, which is at age four, um, my, my dad literally couldn't stand it anymore. Um, when my mom had been pregnant with me, she had the German measles and they were called in and they, they were prepared, um, for things not to go well at that stage when it's the late sixties, um, there's no ultrasounds. Um, it just wasn't going to turn out well. 
um, because this was in the first trimester of my mom's pregnancy. So they went home. Of course, what does a preacher do? He prays about it. Well, dad's on his knees and he's praying. And one night, lo and behold, in front of him are these two, what he called celestial beings, which I thought was very interesting for a minister because you would expect someone, a man of the Bible to say angel. And he couldn't say angel. It's not that he didn't say angel. He couldn't because that's not the image in which they presented themselves. So he goes on to describe what more sounded like some kind of um, interdimensional being. And there were two who came and said, listen, your daughter's going to be okay. Everything is going to work out okay. She's going to be a little different. She's going to come in with some unusual gifts. um, And you need to help her with that. She's chosen you. You've chosen her. And, you know, just help and help guide her through this. Um, so my father, four years later, can't take it anymore because imagine just waiting all the time. You've been told this, by these celestial beings. And of course I come in, I'm a girl. Remember no ultrasound. They didn't know. And they had said your daughter. Um, so dad's, you know, rapidly starting to believe. And there were no complications from the German measles. Dad's really rapidly starting to believe. But then he's waiting for the shoe to drop because these guys have said to him, Hey, she's going to have some unusual abilities. Keep your eyes open. You're going to need to help foster this. So imagine what that must've been like. So at age four, I get called into the kitchen table talk and he sits down and my father was a huge man and this big booming voice, big American football player. And he said, sugar, do you know the difference between alive and dead? I'm four. And I was like, um, um, Now, imagine if he'd had that conversation with me now in 2023, it would be so easy to describe. It would be like talking to somebody on FaceTime, like I'm, I'm doing this via FaceTime and I know somebody or or a Zoom call, somebody's on the other side and I know they're a real person. Like I don't have any doubt whatsoever that I'm talking to any kind of entity or being it's or, or artificial intelligence that there is a real life flesh and blood human being occupying a meat suit on the other side of this camera, wherever they are. So how easy would that have been for four-year-old little me to try and explain that, um, you know, this is what it was like to talk to people. And the reason that they asked that question was because I would always, always talk about my best friend. And my best friend was my grandfather. This was my mom's dad, Dr. Garland Clark. And he would give us, uh, you know, he'd tell me stories, take me on adventures. He'd read to me um, because he was a surgeon. Like I had such a fascination at an early age with medicine and um, not traditional medicine, but about the mind, body, spirit aspect of how a human body functions. And so um, my parents sit down one day and they go, listen, your grandfather, Judge, yeah? well, he's been dead since you were one. And I was like, what does that mean? What does dead mean? Because to me, to little me, you're seeing something that's real, just the same as I know you're on the other side of this watching and that you're real and you're flesh and blood. Judge was real to me in whatever way he was able to project himself and show up for little four-year-old Mary Helen. Uh, But imagine back then in 1973, where your dad's trying trying to filter this through his experience as a a Southern Baptist minister. Oh my God. My mom was just like, yay, because it was her father. So she was always just 100% behind it. But yeah, so it was really, um, it was really interesting. So I'm seeing this take place. But what was fascinating was rather than just feeling or waiting for myself to screw up, because there were a lot of those y'all, I'm watching And I'm getting to feel the impact of things that I did and said and things that were about me and how they unfolded in other people's lives. I was like, oh, oh, this is what the life review is about. Okay. But what was crazy was because it was all happening simultaneously. I literally, when I went back into my body, had to reinvent everything I knew to be true. Everything. You can't even imagine. Um, you know, you have this idea that time is linear or time marches forward. And I'm like, oh, um, time is concurrent. There are multiple timelines that are happening simultaneously. And so, yes, you can 
travel in time. And yes, you can be in different places at the same time. It was, oh my gosh. So I've had the, the distinct um, privilege and it is a privilege. Um, it's a little messed up sometimes. I won't, I won't lie to you, but it's a privilege overall to come back in here and recognize that this is, this is all happening simultaneously. And that those 8 billion plus fractals of the source energy that are here walking around as different people on planet earth, that we're all just fractals of the same whole. Um, you know, we're having different experiences and we're supposed to. So this crazy uproar that we've got going on where we're trying to make everybody exactly the same, trying to make everybody fair, trying to make everybody nice. That's not what this place is built on. It's built, it's built on a dichotomy of dark and light. Well, I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable. Incarnate somewhere else next time. Hate to tell you, because it is perfectly perfect the way that this place is set up. And people have gotten so busy. What did I learn? What's the biggest takeaway from having been dead? It's people are so busy trying to change the schoolhouse. Let's save the environment. Let's do this. Let's say, oh, that's wrong. That's not good. That, that doesn't fit in my religion. Blah, 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 blah. You know, people are so busy trying to change everything that they don't realize that all of these challenges, all of these beautiful boxes to learn and grow and expand from, they were set up for you to change within them. And if I could give you one thing about being dead and coming back into this beautiful world that we live in is stop trying to change everybody into your way of thinking. Stop trying to change everybody into having experiences that make you feel more comfortable. That's not their job. Do you know, it's not their job. Would you expect for, you know, that it would be kind and decent for people to be nice? Yeah, but we know by many years of being here on this planet that that's not the, the normal or else everyone would be like that. We try to help and educate and grow, but in reality, what we're here for is for our own growth, for our own learning, for our own understanding. You know, we've just watched the last three years of absolute chaos and craziness and What's so funny is we watch people become divided and we watch that separation and the finger pointing and all of a sudden the very loving people um, were extraordinarily judgmental towards people who thought differently than they did. Um, guess what? It was meant to be an opportunity for you to show up. So anytime that you feel a little bit uncomfortable or things aren't going your way, it's not about you changing that scenario as much as it's about you showing up and not letting yourself down. You're being given opportunities every single day with every person who crossed your path, whether it's a spouse, uh, a business partner, a, a child, a parent, um, a, a best friend, every single day is offering opportunities. And so that's the big take for me from the near death experience is that um, you are what you love. What you love is what you give your attention to. Um, you know, it's a, a, a version of Emanuel Swedenborg's famous words. And um you know, you already are that which you seek. You're not trying to seek out your own divinity. You walked away from that in order to get in here and get dirty and to get, be out in the trenches and to learn what it feels to be hurt and to hurt and to be part of that great global mass of, of fractals that actually still come from the same hole. So it's really true. You know, you hurt somebody else, you're not hurting them, you're hurting you. No one can harm who you really are. So that's me. And I want to thank you for coming along my little journey. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been great to be here. My, my uh, books and all are available at maryhelenhensley.com. And I'm on all social media and, uh, you know, try to get to everybody as I can. And I've got a, a, a fun little um, project underway right now so I can actually access more people um, in the future. So stay tuned for that. But thank you for, for allowing me to share with you. Um, it doesn't matter how many times I tell this story. I cannot tell you how incredible you are, how incredible we are, and that we came here for all of it. The guts, the glory, the fabulous, the painful, the heartbreaking, the terrifying, the joyful bliss that one can only achieve in the human form. So get out there, take some risks, go have some fun. Because as my dad said, when he was going through his death experience and 
he had not been able to speak for months and he was in shuffling around the room in the nursing home and he couldn't talk and my mom and I were sitting in there it was very late at night and he shuffled over to the bed and he got in and he laid down which is something he'd never do because he he the minister who spent his entire life preaching about heaven and and its glories was terrified to die in those moments and I was like hmm something strange about that so anyway he climbs into the bed and next thing he's giggling like a child and he's reaching up for the ceiling and clear as day he looks at my mom he goes I can see it I can see it mom and I look at each other and she's like oh no is he dying and I went no, the fireworks aren't there. He's having an experience. I said, dad, what can you see? And he said, I can see the land beyond the river, sugar. It is more beautiful than anything you ever wrote about. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And um, so he suddenly gets like a deer in headlights and he just stops and he goes, mama, mama's there. My mom's still looking at me and I'm like, he's not dying just yet. And he goes, she looks so young. And then there was the most profound moment, I think, to date, besides being dead, that I've ever had in my life. My father reaches up his hand, and the most difficult relationship he'd ever had in his life was with his own father. He wasn't there for him. He never showed up for him. Um, he did for other members of the family, I think, but you know, everybody has, every child has a different parent. We've all heard that before. And in, in this case, um, at the time my, my dad was growing up, my grandfather had had a, a drinking problem. Um, he had a lot of issues. And so my father had fretted and stressed his entire adult life that my grandfather, his father, did not get to go based on the criteria that my father understood was necessary for one to enter heaven. My grandfather didn't get to go. And there he stood. And my father, his tears are pouring down his face. He's worried. My mom and I are just like, what? And dad turns around and he looks at my mom and he goes, Helen, I've had it wrong all along. Everybody's welcome here. You can't mess this thing up. And I'll leave you with that.